Welcome to Living Well Church Online. I'm Stephen Petrie. Let's sing and let's worship. Say good morning. We're going to throw it back a little bit with a medley. And Michelle's over here, stage right, uh, platform right, as we like to say in the church. But anywho, welcome. Uh, we're just going to sing, sing out um, in your living room with your family. Raise your hand, stand up, get loud, turn it up really loud. That always helps, you know. Voice. I'll hold on to what is true 
Though I cannot see If the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe I remind myself of all that you've done And the life I have because of your son Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free I am yours I am forever yours Mountain high or valley low I sing out, remind my soul I am yours, I am forever yours When my heart is filled with hope Every promise comes my way When I feel your hands of grace Rest upon me Staying desperate for you, God Staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands in praise I will believe I remind myself of all that you've done And the life I have because of your son Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free I am yours, I am forever yours Mountain high or valley low I sing out, remind my soul I am yours, I am forever yours I am yours I am yours I am yours I am yours All my days Jesus I am yours Well we just pause and think about you right now and we sing I am yours why? Because of that love that came down, Jesus Christ, that came to free us from our sin, to wash us clean. We receive that work, Lord, the work of the cross. And those that might be tuning in by accident or tuning in on purpose, Lord, I pray that we would, we would get how deep that is. That you would send Jesus to redeem all mankind for those that would receive. So I pray, Lord, those that are seeking, those that are just happen to find this somewhere that you would speak to their heart right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and let truth come I am yours I am yours all my days Jesus I am yours I am yours I am yours all my days, Jesus, I am yours. Good morning. I want to spend a little time eulogizing a longtime church member of both churches that I was pastor of, Lori Kector. Some of you may remember her, some of you maybe have never heard her name. You may recall that I received news on January the 8th that both Pastor Jack Hayford and Jackie Dela Cruz had passed away within hours of each other. Jackie had been our youth pastor years ago, uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. After I officiated Jackie's funeral on the 13th of January, I went to bed that night, only to awaken early the next morning, and that's when I learned Lori had passed away also. 
I first became acquainted with Lori Kector when she began attending Thousand Oaks Christian Fellowship in 1995. She had a seven-year-old boy named Brew and was with pregnant with her second boy, McKenna. McKenna was born in Simi Valley in April of 1995. I dedicated him to the Lord in June of that year. I know that due to church records, but also because Lori sent me a copy of his baby dedication signed by me upon his unfortunate death in 2020. Lori became hungry for God, participated in services and other events uh, while she was at the church. And her time at the church was when she grew by leaps and bounds spiritually. God changed her life forever. And she shared with me several times over the years that I would always be her pastor, no matter where she was or where she was attending. We corresponded primarily by email uh, after she left, but when her son died, she called me. And she said, it was because I still consider you to be my pastor after all these years, and yours is the one voice I wanted to hear when I lost McKenna. That was touching. She went on to share that he had received Jesus into his heart when they were attending the church when he was five years old. Shortly after that, he received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, again at TOCF. And then after they had moved away, he was baptized in water in Arizona at age 13. She said he'd also entertained the idea of becoming a pastor. Now, going back to a prior year, I had the honor of officiating her marriage to John in June 2001 at the church. She asked me to be sure and give a call for salvation, which I did. She learned a few years later that one of her cousins had received Christ into their heart at her wedding, and that brought her much joy. Her testimony that uh, when I learned this was in 2016 was that for 15 years this cousin had been leading a beautiful spiritual life. Well, within two weeks of their marriage, they had moved to Missouri so John could pursue his residency at St. Louis University in the medical field. Unfortunately, when she and McKenna got off the plane a few weeks later in Missouri, she said she found a completely different man than who she had married. And in short order, he divorced her and cut communication off with little McKenna, the only dad he ever knew. And he never got over that. So we kept in contact, she and I, and when I created a group for past in-person church members who had moved away but still considered their time at TOCF to be so significant that they still considered to me to be a pastor in their life. I did this in 2016. Well, Lori joined immediately. And she even became connected with Living Well Church in 2018. Uh, she would watch us online. She would comment. Uh, she'd text me. And she began giving financially on a recurring basis every month. And she kept that up until the day of her death. I kept in touch with her quite often for a few months after McKenna's passing. And the one thing she kept remarking about is that it had not yet hit her. She had not had an emotional time crying. She had not experienced any depression. And we both thought it was the grace and the comfort of God. And I do not know the cause of Lori's death um, at, at this time. All I know is that the morning of January 8th, I learned that Pastor Jack Hayford passed away peacefully in his bedroom. And then a few days later, I learned that Lori Kector was found in her home a few days after passing. 
Now, Lori had a genuine heart for people. In the last years of her life, she worked as a human rights activist with global and local projects, primarily in countries such as Congo, Somalia, and Bosnia. She felt a divine calling in life to help those in mortal danger. She succeeded in getting two nominations for humanitarian awards with the United Nations. One was the Aurora Award for a million dollars. The other was the Hilton Humanitarian Award for two million dollars. She said her work was both challenging and satisfying. So I just wanted to highlight the life of Lori Kector, a vital, integral part of our church for many, many years. But I want to end this time by praying for her older son, Brew. Now, Brew had the gruesome job of cleaning out his brother's apartment three years ago and then had to do the same thing for his mom uh, just recently. And again, at the time of this taping, I've not heard an official cause of death for Lori. But let's uh, pray for Brew, and I ask you to join me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your comfort. I thank you, dear Lord, that we have the assurance that both Lori and her youngest son, McKenna, are with you and that our future will be with them. But Brew is still here. And the last time I talked with him, Lord, he was there taking care of things in her home. And I haven't heard from him since then, but I pray for him, dear Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would keep your hand upon him, that you would strengthen him, that he would have a dream and a vision for his life and not suffer unduly because of the passing of his two family members. Keep his heart, dear Lord, warm towards you. I pray that the angels of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit would be with him the rest of his life. I thank you, dear Father, for your comfort. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, let's do a quick review uh, over the topics we've covered in this series and see where we're at. Uh, the series is called The My Greatest Revelations, as you should know. And these are the seven Bible revelations I received during a two to three year period that completely answered questions I had about God's ways, how he works, and the authority of God's written word, and it became preeminent in my life. So looking back, we said that the very first revelation was the revelation of spirit, soul, and body, and its ramifications. You really can't understand even the basics of your salvation until you understand the difference between your spirit your soul, and your body. And my first real exposure to this came from Kenneth E. Hagen. Now, the second revelation was 
how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Wow. To have been in a Pentecostal environment for the years that I was, I still didn't really know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And again, that first real exposure to this type of teaching came again from Kenneth E. Hagin. Thank God for that man. Now, the third revelation was learning how to walk by faith. And you'd think Brother Hagin would be mentioned here. Uh, and he did have uh, a lot of uh, input, you know, through the years. In fact, I remember sitting in Rama, and I realized the quality of this man and how he was a legend in his own time. And there he was with a whiteboard and a class of, you know, maybe 40 kids teaching us, writing on the board, teaching us step by step how to walk by faith. Oh, man, those, those were wonderful days. But the first exposure I really had to that came, first of all, from uh, a minister named Chuck Perkins and then Jerry Savelle. They were the initial teachers. So I, I heard that, uh, you know, this time not uh, from a book about that, but uh, through preaching. And um, it was just phenomenal to sit in those services with those two men. Now, the fourth revelation was learning that it was God's will that I be healed. That was a tough one for me. Uh, again, due to my background and the tradition of the church, um, I just never had heard that. It just wasn't clear. A lot of these things just were not clear because we didn't have real clear teaching, apparently. Um, and this was... Um, you know, a, a combination of Brother Hagen and Jerry Savelle, although it was Jerry Savelle's cassette tape um, when I was in the midst of a two-month cold that did it for me. And uh, it was just a supernatural experience. Again, I had kind of closed myself up in my dormitory this time and said, I'm not coming out until I know. Because I'd been struggling with this for, uh, you know, the whole time. Uh, months and uh, then I had this cold on top of it and you know the devil was just trying to steal the seed the word you know from me but uh, it was while listening to that tape by Jerry Savelle that it became uh, I became absolutely convinced that healing was for me Arlen Steen that God wanted me to be healed every time I got sick. And then I learned he wanted me not to get sick, but to walk in health. So praise God for the word. Now, the fifth revelation is one of righteousness. And again, this revelation exploded on the inside of me due to the preaching of Jerry Savelle. Now, again, I learned a lot more about all of these topics, you know, as time went on from Brother Hagen and Brother Savelle and uh, E.W. Kenyon and Charles Price. Man, I spent a lot of time uh, reading Charles Price's book on the real faith. And it just, it just was a boon to my spiritual life in my, uh, you know, 19th year, 20th year, early 20s when I was just getting exposed to these things and so hungry. And uh, then being exposed to other people, others that, you know, I'll mention here. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's where righteousness came from to begin with. It was a three-day, I think, six-meeting seminar Jerry Savelle put on in that church. Now, the sixth great revelation of my wife, uh, life is walking in love. Now, this one, there was a book involved, but it came really in the midst of a trial in April and May of 1976. Um, I, I, had, I was familiar with this book that I will mention. Um, but remember, I'd received my fifth great revelation in March of 1976 when Jerry Savelle came to our church in our Bible school and preached a three-day meeting on righteousness, like I just said. Well, he finished on a Saturday. And then the very next day, 
we had another surprise guest in our church, Mrs. Gordon Lindsay. Now, I'd read after, you know, Gordon Lindsay and his books uh, and still have them in my library, but here she was. So I got exposed to, you know, in person now with a lot of these people. I continued to attend Bible classes in the morning, and, and as I shared already, I worked for Union Carbide in the afternoon and night. Um, the school year would end the last day of April. And um, then a week after Jerry finished, um, I completed my application for Rama. And I had settled that. You know, I mailed it on sh my sister Sharon's birthday. Her 18th birthday is when I mailed that application to Tulsa. And I was pumped. You see, a few of us had been studying about intercessory prayer, and we'd spend time doing that. We'd actually spend time in prayer. You know, today we have these things over Facebook and text, you know, you know, sending prayers to you, just a little, you know, emoji or something, or good wishes. It wasn't good wishes and it wasn't emojis. We were getting into prayer. And um, a couple of other uh, of our, you know, uh, students were getting cold and, and on a couple of occasions, I ministered to them and watched their fire for God rekindle. That was exciting. Uh, and I was getting very excited because a number of us planned a trip to Tulsa. We were going to go see the, our friends that were already there and discover what Rhema was like. I'd never been, uh, you know, to, uh, to Tulsa before. So after a midweek service at our church in Florence in April, Five of us crowded into a van, and we drove all night and all the next day and got to uh, Tulsa at 9 p.m., and we were there for five days. I got in on a taping at Oral Roberts University with Jerry Lewis, the comedian. I heard Brother Hagen teach at Rama. I witnessed Vicki Jameson's meeting twice. I didn't know much about her, but she was like otherworldly. Reminded me a little bit about Catherine Kuhlman. Um, I, I just cannot explain to you how impacting all of this was. Um, I, I knew of Oral Roberts, of course, but there was his university. Another otherworldly thing architecturally. And then to get back, the way it worked out, uh, I had to fly. Well, I'd never flown before in my life. So my first airplane ride was from Tulsa uh, with about five stops and finally got back to South Carolina. So all this was great and exciting, but in the middle of this, you know, the pastor at the church did not share any of our enthusiasm um, because, you know, some of us would be moving on uh, from the school he'd founded and uh, a close friend of mine had decided to go with me to Oklahoma, and uh, we were making plans to do just that. And on the last day of this school year, our pastor spoke to me privately and told me he didn't think it was God's will that I leave and go to Tulsa. Well, this was very frustrating because... I really enjoyed my time at the church. I really enjoyed my time at the school. And because of him and his ministry, I'd been exposed to so much. And I was so thankful for that. But in my heart, I knew what my next step was to be. That had been settled in February when I spent a weekend fasting and praying in Meemaw's motel about my next step. So immediately after this conversation, we had our last time together as a class. So he spoke to me just before this class. We went into class, and he talked about, you know, what had taken place this first year. And it was great. It was exciting. But then he asked those of us who would not be returning next year to leave the room. So there were about three or four of us that uh, this was a surprise to, to all of us. But we got up and, and left because he told us to. Well, I heard later that he talked about his plans for next year. But unfortunately, that wasn't all he talked about. 
the friend, actually the friend whose van we used to uh, travel to Tulsa, um, sat on the front row in that class. And she was planning to go back. And uh, she taped the entire class. And he knew it. She taped every class, so it wasn't a surprise. And he could see her right there doing it. Well, the next day, she contacted me and gave me the tape. And she said that he had talked badly about me and two other students in front of everyone. Well, I was devastated. This was my third pastor. My dad had been my first pastor. He never did anything like that. Um, pastor J.L. Dutton was my second pastor, a very loving man. He never did anything like that. And I didn't mean this pastor any harm. I was just excited about the word. And, um, you know, that caught my attention, caught my fancy. Um, he was a little more charismatic in his ministry and presentation. And um, I, was, I was leaning in a different direction. And I just wanted to follow my heart. I was 20 years old. So I went into the toughest emotional tailspin I'd ever been in up until that time. And uh, it really wreaked havoc in my soul. Now, as I mentioned, I'd also been introduced to another book. And actually, the books, all the books of E.W. Kenyon. I devoured his books during this time. You know, a new kind of righteousness. Um, you know, signpost on the road to success. I wore a copy out of that book, just a little mini book, 30 some odd pages. But some, for periods of time, I would read that book every day. Every day. All the way through, again, the next day and the next and the next. It was just good stuff, you know. The Father and being in the Father in His presence. Um, understanding righteousness. All these books. Well, one of them that I'd been reading was titled The New Kind of Love. And I want to share some excerpts uh, from this book. And there's a purpose behind it. He wrote this on page six. And he, he was poetic. He said, there are two little words in the new law of the new covenant that challenge me. He said, they reached out their tender hands and gripped me. I saw the dainty tendril of a climbing vine lay its soft, fragile hand upon the coarse, hard rock. And after a bit, it had fastened itself to the rock. Those two little words seemed like the delicate fingers of that beautiful climbing vine. You ask me what the words are? Even as. Even as. That ye love one another even as I have loved you. At first I tried to get away from them, but they followed me. Followed as only love can follow. I could hear them in the chambers of my soul like the memory of a long forgotten hymn that comes back and raps at the door of the heart. That's beautiful. And much of his writing is that way, kind of poetic. Well, I had a similar experience because... I now had the tape of that class where this pastor was bad-mouthing some of his students. And I consulted with the others, the other friends, and uh, we thought about taking it to the elders of the church. You see, I and we wanted to keep the tape as evidence. And the next day, though, I was shocked. That was on a Saturday. The next day was Sunday. And early on Sunday morning, this was May the 2nd, 1976, uh, we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have, you know, Apple products, but our house phone rang, and it was this pastor. I was taken aback because he never called 
And I was intimidated by the fact that he had called. And when I got on the line, he didn't apologize. He simply said, I want that tape. Well, I wasn't planning on and didn't attend church that morning. I didn't attend church at his church where I normally went or anywhere. I was so distraught. I was in the what we call the front bedroom of our house. It was actually my sister's bedroom. And I vividly remember laying in the front bedroom of our house and I was hurting so bad. So I pulled out this book, The New Kind of Love, as I was battling this question, should I keep the tape for evidence or should I give it back to him as he's asked? Now understand when you're young, you know, you really take things hard sometimes. And, and uh, I, I needed Jesus to come and sort of rescue me. I needed Jesus to minister to me and to show me what to do. Well, he did just that. He did it, though, because it was as if Reverend E.W. Kenyon were right there in the room talking to me. I could feel the presence of God. But the words that were coming were through this book. Actually, it was Jesus talking to me through this book. And the more I read, I received the revelation of walking in love. And so I have to credit E.W. Kenyon and his book on the new kind of love. Because as, as I lay on that bed for a couple of hours just in emotional pain and struggling with this question of should I keep this or should I give it to him, I got a revelation of not only the love of God but what to do. Now, in this book, he said things like this, which just, you know, was like heaven, like Jesus speaking right to me. And it just hit my heart so strong. First thing he said was, when we step out of love, we step out of the will of the master. Well, my goodness, that was the last thing I wanted to do. I was trying to I'd, I'd been out of the will of God for two years. I'm trying to get back in the will of God. But if I step out of love, I'm going to step out of the will of the master. Ah, oh, you know, some of this stuff was kind of hard to hear. And he goes on to say, whenever we act out of love, we act contrary to, to the will of our Lord. And that was on page 11. Then he said this, when our prayers are not answered, we invariably ask this question. Have I stepped out of love? That was on page 11. Well, I knew I was going to be doing some praying in the future, and man, I didn't want to step out of love because that would stop my prayer life from working. Then he said this, the name, he's talking about the name of Jesus. The name gives us access to the Father. But if we step out of love, the name is of no value to us. No, I didn't want to hear that. You mean the name of Jesus would be of no value to me if I stepped out of love? So if I kept this tape as evidence, does that mean I'm not walking in love? All these questions were just swirling around in my head. Then he said this, we can only use the name of Jesus as we walk in love. That was on page 12. And then he said, when we step out of love, it breaks our fellowship with the Father. It weakens our faith and makes the Bible almost a closed book to our hearts. That was page 12. Well, my goodness, the Bible was just becoming an open book to me. I was receiving revelations Things I was learning I'd never heard before. It wasn't just head knowledge. It just wasn't, you know, the Greek that I was taking in, in uh, New Testament class, or in Greek class, rather, this first year. These were heart revelations that were changing my life. I couldn't allow the Bible to again become a closed book to me. Then he wrote this. 
The measure of our love is the measure of our worth to society. That was page 20. Then he said this, the men and women who walk in this new kind of love never injure anyone, never take advantage of anyone. They simply walk and live in God. So if I kept this tape, would I be taking advantage of something that a friend had given to me at the expense of this pastor? These questions, I tell you, they were swirling around. Then I read this. He said, when selfishness is eliminated in us and love gains the ascendancy, we will not seek our own any longer. We will seek only the Father's will, which will be to the best interest of all the Father's children. Ah, well, I wanted, I wanted the best, you know. He wrote this. That was page 37. He said, you see that with love comes the ability to love and to do the thing that love would prompt you to do. That was on page 65. So I'm reading this whole book. And these phrases, just some of them are just popping out at me. And it's as if, again, Jesus were there in the room speaking these things to me. It was very supernatural, not spectacular. I was there all by myself, but it was supernatural. Then he wrote this, there's a love that will enable us to love the unlovely and the disagreeable and the hateful. Now listen to this. There is a love that will enable us to love them when they are doing all they can to injure us. That was page 93. I thought that, well, that fits. There's somebody trying to injure me. So I laid there for, you know, all morning and then we'd arrange for my uh, two other friends to come over and they came to my house, got there about mid-afternoon and uh, none of us had gone to church. We discussed, they were all doing s sort of the same thing I was doing. So we discussed what to do and we outlined a plan to go see the pastor and give him the tape and forgive him. And we were going to walk in love. We all made that decision. So when we walked into his office, I, I get sort of emotional at times, and you know, I'm not a crier, but boy, when I cry, it comes like a flood. And I had a flash flood of tears when I saw his face. And, and I'm the one that had the tape. Uh, I was sitting the closest to him, and, and I told him, I said, I forgive you, and I'm going to give you this tape. He said, and I said, if you need to hear the tape to make sure it was the one that you wanted, uh, I said, I'll just give it to you. And he said, no. Uh, so I said, well, I'm just going to tear it up. I literally tore the tape out of that cassette. And I destroyed it in front of his eyes. And it was covered in water as I was crying. I was just so tore up. So... He, uh, he asked if we would stay for the evening service. So we stayed for that. It was a closing convocation, actually, for the school. And we received our certificates of completion. And then um, um, my one friend and I, we eventually left and drove together to Oklahoma. The other guy stayed around there in Florence. So... That was 76, like I said. Well, I entered school in, in uh, Tulsa in the fall of 76 and graduated in 77. And uh, then from there, um, you know, I went to um, uh, Baxter Springs, Kansas, and I served uh, my first time in the full-time ministry, and I was a youth pastor. So there was one other time, one other time, that I had personal interaction with this pastor. He began a television ministry uh, just as we were leaving in South Carolina. And he wanted to expand it. And he did, and eventually he was in five states as well as on a station or two in Canada. Well, 
just under two years after my last contact with him in South Carolina, um, I discovered that he was doing a telethon in Joplin, Missouri to get his program on the air. Now, Baxter Springs is right, right over the Oklahoma line and just about 12 miles from the Missouri line. And, and they're in that very southeastern corner of Kansas. Um, you know, when we did all our shopping and stuff, it was in Joplin. Well, this is where he was, 12 miles away. I could not believe it. I thought of all the places he could go to expand his TV ministry, why in the world does he come right where we are? And he contacted me and asked me if I would, you know, plug his new endeavor. And, um, you know, I kind of passed this test before I gave him the tape. So I figured this is just, you know, another thing to do to, you know, continue developing in love. So I went down to KODE TV and uh, we had people, you know, that came to our little church from, you know, a lot of the area. Baxter Springs wasn't very large, so uh, there was a lot of uh, farmers and country people, you know, that would come. But I plugged this program, and honestly, I did not want to. Um, it just seemed that something wasn't just right about him. And, you know, I, I tend to shy away from, uh, you know, certain individuals that just don't feel right to me. Um, it took me a little while to come to the conclusion, but I did. And uh, I just wondered, how could he not show any remorse in bad-mouthing us or when we had the meeting with him? But I did that telethon for him because of 2 Corinthians 5.14. It says this, for the love of Christ compels us. Amplified Bible says, for the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us. The Message Bible says, Christ's love has moved me to such extremes. His love has the first and last word in everything we do. That's what I was attempting to practice. The Voice Bible says, you see, the controlling force in our lives is the love of the Anointed One. Well, I did my part and left. I've never seen him again. Uh, since 1978. But uh, after a number of years, uh, more than maybe two decades, um, I heard a little bit about what he went through and what happened to him. And now at the time, back in 76, this, this was a huge test for me. As again, I'd never had a pastor except loving men. But I learned he's had a checkered past. He's moved his ministry from place to place. Unfortunately, he's been charged with um, a few felonies and a couple of misdemeanors. He even spent time in jail. Um, he was facing, actually, decades in prison. But he got out somehow, and the last I heard, he was back in ministry. It's so sad, and yet... Um, you know, anybody can recover. Now, I'm not in touch with him, and uh, I'm just sharing this because it, it, it was a preparation for me. This really was peanuts compared to what I was going to face. And I don't know how I would have fared later on if I hadn't have gone through this. You see, God uses things that are uncomfortable to us, tribulations, but He can use it for our good. It's not that he brings them, but you know, you can, you can use almost anything to your good. And you know, natural life can be hard. Natural life can be unforgiving. And there came a time years later, and I, I'm not going to go into depth on that, but I do want to ask you the question. Do you know what you would do if you were faced with betrayal or unfaithfulness 
in the most intimate relationship of your life. Now, I know some of you have. I had not after almost 29 years of marriage. But I can tell you this, the pain is absolutely numbing. When you walk into your house and you discover the greatest nightmare that a married man or a married woman can, can find. And when it happened to me, both my heart and my mind went racing at the speed of light. Now, my mind wanted to do great physical damage to the fellow that was there, but my heart, I couldn't believe it, but my heart felt the love of God brimming up. And really, that is one of the two major reasons that uh, I did not listen to my mind and get into a physical altercation. I was absolutely amazed that I could sense the love of God like a flowing river oozing up from my heart and calming me. Now, this, was the, this love wasn't going out towards the violators. It was giving me life and strength to stand without doing something stupid in the moment. And this is why that happened. Now, again, this is not spectacular because nobody was there to see it. Again, it was just me. But it was very supernatural. And it happened because of Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5 5, 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's love has been poured out in us. It's in there. Um, J.B. Phillips says this doesn't mean, of course, that we have only a hope of future joys. We can be full of joy here and now, even in our trials and tribulations. Taken in the right spirit, these very things will give us patient endurance. This, in turn, will develop a mature character, and a character of this sort produces a steady hope a hope that will never disappoint us. Boy, that's a mouthful. Now here's Arthur S. Way's translation. I have meditated on this time and time and time again, and I just love it. It says, The brimming river of God's love has already overflowed into our heart. I've seen pictures. I've seen rivers at flood stage. And that's a picture of the love of God at flood stage, just overflowing us. And you know when you need a flood stage of the love of God that is the fruit in you? It's when you walk into a situation like that and you see unholiness taking place before you. Clarence Jordan said this, For God has given us a love transfusion by the Holy Spirit. That's language we can understand. So I am so thankful that I allowed the love of God to control my actions early on back in 1976 and then many times after so that when a much bigger test came, I was ready for it. Now, I would never want the first thing to ever happen to me again, but I wouldn't take a million dollars for that experience. So, the new kind of love, chapter titled, It Works, page 93. Kenyon says, there is a love that can stand the test of modern life. There is a love that will enable us to love the unlovely and the disagreeable and the hateful. There is a love that will lift us up into God's class where we love the ungodly and the unworthy. He says, there is a love that will make us just like the master so that we would not only live for men, but also die for them. There is a love that will enable us to love them when they are doing all they can to injure us. There is a love that will whisper, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yes, there is a love. If you are a new creation, you have found this new kind of love. Yes, this new kind of love works. 
It can be trusted to do the thing we declare it will do. You know, the time to declare that you walk in love is when there are no issues. So that when the issue comes, that love will be able to come up and manifest itself. Now, Kenyon goes on to say, um, it is God's nature gaining the mastery in our lives. And wherever it gains the mastery, it works. It makes hard, bitter men gentle as Jesus. It will take a man like Saul of Tarsus and make him like Paul. It will take men out of the lowest depths of the slums and lead them into the pulpits where they will lead multitudes to Christ. Well, thank God for His love. His love is so great and wonderful that He can change the most incredibly hard, frustrating, difficult situation into one that you can handle. I'm telling you from experience. And it can make the most hardened person into a loving person. I could tell you stories of tough people and people in tough situations who've come to faith in Christ and have had their lives changed and they've stayed the course through thick and thin. I have a friend, a pastor, who came out of the hippie movement back in the late 60s. God got hold of him and he has been a very dedicated Christian man and a pastor for many decades. He today is as pure as they come. It's just, it's just amazing, uh, the people that you come in contact with, especially as a pastor, but even just being an individual. People that you know whose lives have been transformed by the power of God, transformed by the love of God, transformed by the fruit of the Spirit. But it won't happen unless you allow Jesus to come into your heart. Unless you allow God to love you. Allow Him to love you the way He does. His love for you is greater than anything you can think of. You've never been loved unless you've been loved by Jesus. Won't you allow God to do that for you? Pray the prayer with us after our closing song. Allow Christ to come into your life. thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am well i've seen many searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father 
It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe he is your son and that he died for me. His shed blood cleanses me from all sin. I believe he arose from the dead. I confess him as my Savior and Lord. According to your word, I am now born again and going to heaven. Okay, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, you're now a new person in Christ. There's no doubt about it. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, give us a comment. Comment about it on YouTube or Rumble. Or send us an email at this address. Info, that's I-N-F-O, at lwcvc.org. We can send you some materials to help you get started in walking with God and would love to do so. Now stay tuned to learn how you can give to God as well as the Living Well Church. And hey, if you haven't yet joined the 40 donors we're looking for, consider it today. Again, you may contact us at info at lwcvc.org for more information about this donor thing. And we will send you a link that bypasses our website and goes straight to the giving platform where you may set up an account. So pray and ask God if you should participate. Remember this phrase, pray and obey.
Now, as we close today's service, let's close with the ironic blessing. Here we go. You receive this in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. I've got peace in my river. I've got love like an ocean. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got peace in my river. I've got love like an ocean. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got peace like a river in my soul. Ah, oh, I love like an ocean in my soul I've got peace in my like a river I've got love like an ocean I've got joy like a fountain in my soul I've got peace in my like river I've got love like an ocean I've got joy like a fountain in my soul I've got peace like a river in my soul Love like an ocean in my soul Oh